it's fun seeing folks and then seeing them again and seeing them on fire and excited and growing. That's a joy. I tell people it's one thing if I preach clear because I feel like I'm going <laughs> to. It's not arrogance. I, just, I, I do. I, I, I don't preach sermons. You figured that out, right? I speak out of who he is in my life. I, all I do is open up my life and bear witness of truth. So I feel like I'm going to preach clear because I, I, I like who I've become. I have no problem with me. I like hanging out with me. I used to not like me at all. I needed you to like me so I felt better about myself. And I was at the mercy of men my whole life. I needed you to appreciate me and affirm me because I didn't feel affirmed. And I had total identity crisis. You follow me? And uh, I needed you to say good things about me because it made me think that there was something good about me because I didn't believe it. <laughs> now I like me. I'm like, cool. I, I slept with me last night. <laughs> it, it was amazing. It was just... <laughs> It was just me and Jesus, man. He loves me. I was in little Brooklyn's bed. I didn't even walk down the spread, man. I laid on top of the bed. I was just, it was so pretty. That bed was so bad. Man, no, I, I, no. I don't know why I do that. I just, at all. And, but you laid them pillars on there for me. I used them. Thanks. But I slept with me last night. I woke up. I looked in the mirror and it was me. And I was good with that. Because I like who I've become. I, I have a clear conscience. I have no trouble living with me. I have no trouble looking in the mirror in the morning. There's a lot of folks that don't like who they are. And they haven't allowed the truth to fashion them. And they're coveting other things and people. And resenting their own uniqueness. And they're compared to the others. And ah, it's just rhetoric. It's just, it'll drive you. See, it's important that you love who you've become in Christ so you love your neighbor as yourself. I talked about that a little bit. I just didn't go into a lot of detail, but the greatest commandment is love God with everything you are. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So this thing's all about love and becoming love. So the clear view, it's not arrogance, guys. It's not presumptuous. It's not vanity, earthly vanity, like thinking you're somebody. It's all in light of truth. It's all within perspective of the finished work of Christ. So to look at yourself in the mirror and realize you have value to God is not blasphemy. You have to have value to God. He never paid such a high price. Come on. Who buys something and writes the check and spends the money and swipes the card if they don't feel what they're purchasing is worth the value Amen. that they pay? In fact, I know you people. You actually feel, always feel like you got a bargain or you don't swipe the card. <laughs> So you actually feel like you're getting more than your, your purchase price. You, you feel like you're getting more for your money. Isn't that true? I know you guys, I'm the same way. When I leave a car dealer, I feel like I got the best buy available. Or I wouldn't have bought the car. I feel like, the, I, feel like I, I got the best deal out of that salesman. And got his commission to the most modest commission available and you feel that way. I know guys that think they got the deal of the century. So they write the check because they feel like what they're getting in return is well worth the price. Now, now see, we don't think of the gospel that way sometimes. And that's why I keep saying this phrase about letting life speak louder than truth. You, you, once we're born again, guys, we have to stop letting life dictate our value. We've got to stop letting people's lack of understanding and all that stuff determine who you are. Or you're just going to go to church and be like the people that don't go to church. Amen. Come on, I'm not being mean, I'm being real. Yeah. And you'll sing all the songs that they're not singing, but you'll be the same in a lot of ways. You'll get thrown into crisis and respond like the man that doesn't even believe there's a God. Wow. And the only difference is you attend services and go to church and that's your belief system. Now that defines your Christianity. It's not your faith, your understanding, or your transformation. The gospel has to be more powerful than me putting myself in a room with people that say they believe the same and then get thrown in life and react the same as the people that don't believe. There has to be something more about the gospel. You follow me? So what's so important is that I have to like 
become. I, I've got to see the love of God and begin to love myself for the way he sees me. If he shed the blood of Jesus, don't you believe that he believes the price paid is well worth the possession purchased? The only reason we have a hard time believing that, we just sang the song about, you know, I'm looking at these promises and your initial reaction is, God, you must be out of your mind. That's your initial reaction. But when you get understanding, you start to understand the promises and you understand, like people say, I can't believe why God would love us like this. It's simple to see now that you understand a word why God would love us this way. He loves who he made you to be. He loves your created value. He loves your destiny and love won't let that die. Your potential is the same no matter how messed up your life is. You have the same potential you've always had. You have the same created value. Your inheritance is in the Lord. Come on, man. You could be reaping some natural consequences for mistakes you made, but you still have the capacity to be the man or woman of God that you always have been anointed to be. You could be 30 years in prison, be transformed and fulfill purpose in the prison. You make the greatest mistake of your life and it could cost you in the natural. And natural justice is taking its course. And it could seem like your life is over and now you're locked up in prison. And you could be a shining light and an example of the living Christ for those 30 years. And let God redeem purpose right in that place. And you can walk in God. You can, you can find the love of God in that place. The understanding, revelation, the power of God. And, and manifest Christ to inmates who have no hope or whatever. And you could have just as amazing of a testimony and legacy at the end of your journey than if you'd ever just went the way you could have. So is God really limited? No. Does love ever fail? No. Here's why love never fails. It's simple to understand, guys. This stuff is simple. It's not rocket science. I think we've been trained to think so deep. We think there's a deep mystery behind everything. Here's why love never fails. Because love never changes its mind about the potential of the object. Glory. It's so simple. We've been trained to say, boy, if they didn't get it by now, they're never going to get it. Boy, if they didn't change by now, they're never going to change. We've been trapped reading a book by its cover, judging with outward appearance, face value, and we determine the potential of the product by its performance. I don't know if I can. I don't have it written down, but it was good. It was clear, man. You're really messing with me now. You're getting me to try to back up and get in a current that already passed by. <laughs> Here's what we do. We judge things by outward appearance. We read a book by its cover. We judge the value of something by its performance instead of its potential. I did it. I, I actually got in faith. That's why I stalled and backed up. I was trusting God. Because I'm a flower. I don't have a textbook. I just have a heart full of him. And he has permission to say things however he wants. And sometimes I think I ought to write that down. I'd preach that sometime. <laughs> I get tempted. I told a pastor last week. I said, dude, that was so good. He said, that was good. I said, write that down. I think I'm going to preach that. It's so funny. Because sometimes I can't remember how I said it. But, and I want to talk about, I want to talk about relationship and intimacy because it's not wrong to study your Bible. I'm not saying that. Don't read into ever, anything I'm ever saying. And don't just, just read into it and, and really hear what I'm saying. It's not wrong to study your Bible. My pastor puts a lot of time in his Sunday morning sermons. There's a grace on his life. He has faith for that. He, word of wisdom. He, he sees ahead for the people. He hears the heart of God for his people. You see what I mean? The grace that was on my heart and what God told me when I got saved he said, I'm going to give you revelations of love and righteousness. I was three days saved. He's speaking to me. It's not my fault. I'm not extra spiritual. I didn't earn this. He's just grace. I'm at work. He's talking to my heart. I'm overwhelmed. I'm going, this is God. I'm overwhelmed because I came from three days ago, no God reality, to God, you're really real. When he revealed himself to me, I jumped and screamed and spun at work, looked like I needed two sedatives and an extra strong straitjacket. <laughs> Laughed, screamed, cried, made a scene, pulled my hair. I remember pulling my hair and spinning in circles going, you're real. Ah, you're really real. Oh, you're real. 
and I can't act it out, it would be offensive to you. I went ballistic. Because my heart went from death to life. Went from zero to a hundred plus percent. I surrendered myself. I looked in my heart and said in my heart, I don't ever want to live this man again. It's zero. It's pitiful. And I'm finally admitting it and I don't want this. I looked up at one. I didn't even know if he was real and said, if you're real, if you love me, have a plan for me and can forgive me for all these things that I see. I'm yours. I live for you. And heaven overtook me. 18 years ago, I've never been the same. I had zero God reality and the lights went and God was real. And I knew in my heart I'd never be the same. I just knew in my heart this wasn't going to wear off. It wasn't going to wane. It wasn't going to fall away. It wasn't going to disappear. I just knew in my heart because I gave myself to him. (laughs) You get it? I didn't incorporate him into my life. I gave him my life. There's a big difference. Some of us got trapped along the way just bringing him into who we are, hoping he makes it better. He wants to transform you. He wants you. God reality opened up in my life. I think sometimes we, in the process of denying ourselves, we don't understand. We give our lives the best we understand and we hold on to a lot of things that show up along the way. We hold on to rights that are supposed to be surrendered. We have a right to certain things. And, and you know, you have one right as a Christian. Manifest Him. One right. You give up your life to obtain one right to look like Him. To love. If you start thinking about your rights, you're going to have a reason to be less than Him. If Jesus took His life personal... Folks wasn't appreciating him like you would think. He did a lot of good things in his life and ministry on the earth. And it got so extreme that it ended up death on a cross. One day they're screaming Barabbas, cheering that he's beaten and and, and abused. And he never did one thing wrong. That's a platform for some serious issues right there. You got a court case. And you ought to win. And he never said a word. It's called love. Not enablement. He's not a doormat. He's love. And he knows that if he shows us what love is, and if he be lifted up, in time, grace is going to draw all men to him. Because the world can finally see what love looks like. Because it wasn't just preached, it was revealed, it was demonstrated, it was lived. It wasn't just a doctrine given, it was a life lived and we beheld him. That's why it's so important for you and I to let the word become flesh. That's why it's so important for you and I to let the word become who we are. Knowledge will puff you up. You can quote the Bible and be puffed up. And let quoting the Bible define your spirituality. And actually have a heart inside that you can't find the things in Jesus' heart that you obtain. And you find your identity in your quoting the Bible or your background. None of those things define who you are. Christ in you defines who you are. The Bible says it on a, on a, on, on purpose that knowledge puffeth up. Love edifies. <laughs> Are you guys all right? You don't, want, you don't want to get puffed up. Knowledge. Puff you up. Love edifies. And in love is great revelation. So Jesus talks to me three days saved. No comparison to people that preach sermons and put notes down and study. It's a different grace. It's something he called me to. My pastor's an awesome minister. Have the same kind of heart. People see the love of God in him. The Lord said, I'm going to give you revelations of my love and righteousness. And you're going to speak to many of my people. I'm three days saved. I'm going, huh? I'm like, 
I was humbled by it. I wasn't like, I'm going to preach in front of the crowd. <laughs> I was, huh? It was humbling. I was like, what? It wasn't anything I desired. It, it was something God said. He said, however, Dan, I'm not calling you and asking you to ever read your Bible to preach a sermon. It was that extreme. I don't ever want you to read your Bible to preach a sermon. He said, only read your Bible to know me. And only ever speak out of who I am in your life. And that will multiply. And he began to teach me that each seed produces after its own kind. And if I preach from a place of revelation, it has the power to bring revelation and transformation and change. If I speak out of the reality of God, then the reality of God can birth in someone else's heart. If I speak from what I'm enjoying and tasting and living, then it can come, be, come alive in the heart of the hearer. If you honor a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive the reward of what you honor. And the thing you honor becomes your reality. That's what that scripture means. If you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. The thing that you receive, the thing that you honor, the thing that you value becomes your revelation. Why? Because you're open to hear it and become it because you see it. <laughs> That's why it's a tragic thing to get caught in a contesting, debating, assessing. Here's Jesus. The only thing about him, everything about him is only ever right. And they got caught in a mindset listening for what was wrong with what was only right. And if you listen from that ear long enough, you'll come up with something wrong. Even though everything was right about Jesus. So they didn't listen to hear God. They listened to find fault. Do you mean preachers listen to preachers just to find fault? Really? And they call it protecting their sheep and all this stuff. But you can't look. You could curse at me and scream at me. And I don't encourage you to do that. I'm saying if you would, if you would, and I'm in an office and you bust open the door and you curse at me and you scream and rant and look like you're going to punch me, spin and walk out. God forbid I'm so surfaced that I go, well, my ears aren't a dumping ground and I just resist everything they said. Come on, get off of religion. Love says what has them so worked up that they don't have the ability to express in a good manner, but they got something going on. They're crying out. What are they trying to say? Yes. Who cares how they said it? Let's not be so thin-skinned. Well, I hear what you're saying, brother. I just don't like the way you're saying it. Oh, so you dismiss what they're saying because of the way they said it? Is it still truth? Do you hear what they're saying? Then why is how they say it mattering so much? Come on. Even Paul said, you know what? There's some out preaching the gospel sincerely and there's some out preaching in spite of my chains and they, they want to seem to create this and that. And he was exposing motives and he said, however, nonetheless, I'm pumped because either way, the gospel's being preached. <laughs> and we'll let that thing work out in the wash. That's not my issue. And I'm not going to let my heart get hard. I'm glad the gospel's being proclaimed. Let a man's heart stand before God. That's not my issue. Next thing you know, you'll find yourself in judgment and presumption. There was a time in my life, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I was going to pray for some pastors in our town because I, I was finding some fault with them. And I thought now I had a platform for intercession. <laughs> and I went to pray and God hushed me real loud. And my spirit shook inside. He went, shh. When I was ready, Father, I lift these pastors before you. I had a case. I was going to intercede. Bring their faces before the Father. He said, shh. He said, Dan, that has nothing to do with you. He said, you're only going to pray because you found what's wrong with those men. And if I let you pray from that place, it won't be long until something's very wrong with you. And I bawled and fell on the floor and realized if he didn't father me, I'd make a mistake quickly. The arrogance that we walk in and think it's okay. The presumption, the pride, the wrong motives. Without the Holy Spirit, we have no hope, guys. We have been trained by the world. 
We have been trained by the fall of man. You have to humble yourself in the sight of God. You have to make yourself so available and assume to really know nothing until he teaches you because until he teaches you, you know nothing. The way that seems right to a man is destroying us. And it gets laced into our Christianity and we bring that mindset into our faith. We still assume and we still presume and we still read books by the cover. We still have first impressions if you don't deal with your heart. You still think you know somebody before you really know somebody. I'm telling you, this stuff has hurt us, man. And you think it's okay that that's normal to live that way. And it's not the love of God. Love believes the best, thinks no evil. You look at a young couple and they're a little close and you think, I bet they're doing it. They're doing it. They shouldn't be in church. They're doing it. Next thing you know, you treat them like they're doing it. And you don't even know they're doing it. You just think they are. You look at somebody and you know they have a history and that knowledge is eating at you because they have a history. And then you start looking through that screen and you say, I think, I think they're influenced right now. They're in church and I think they're influenced right now. You know, I bet, they, I bet they're back in that mess again. And all of a sudden you'll treat them like that or you'll pray like that. And then you screen them like that and you treat them like that. And it's amazing how what you see and believe starts to come out of you in a way. Love thinks no evil, man. Love believes the best. I, I tell a story where, and I'm not telling you to do this, but I tell a story where I, I picked up a prostitute without thinking in my car to take me to a lady that was lost out there somewhere in the streets, and it really broke my heart. But she was really doing good. Do you ever see somebody really doing good? And then all of a sudden, they just, they just were gone. Really doing good, man. Like, you're rejoicing like a parent over a child, just rejoicing. And all of a sudden, she's just, you can't find her. And your heart gets concerned. And all of a sudden, somebody lets you know and, and says, I'm really sure. Because they were overseeing her life. She's not been doing well the last couple of days. And I'm sure she took off. It's just pointing that way. Uh, and I said, I will find her. I, I, I handed my microphone to an elder and said, I will find her. She respects me. I just took off. That was supposed to be preaching Sunday night service. I turned over the elder and bolted out my truck and went to find her. She was doing good. And I went to the crack houses to look for her. Because she matters. She matters. So does everybody you pass along the way down there. They matter so much. You see, you go to seminary. There's things you don't do. You're taught are no-nos across the board, man. There's things that your conscience says are no-nos across the board. You, when you go to a women's prison, you're a man. You're not allowed to show emotion, affection. You're not allowed to exchange touch in a women's prison. I don't know if you know that. But there's times I've held them like they were my own daughters. Because the position I'm in gives me the authority and privilege. And nobody touches me in that moment. Because it's not presumption. I'm not being arrogant. I don't even think about it. It's blind. It's love. And it's like nobody sees it. I've had guards over my shoulder. Dan, you're too close. You can't touch like that. There's monitors all over the place. They're going to stop. They're going to kick you out of the prison. And I don't let go. I say, they won't touch me. I'm in that position. I'm okay. Love is allowing me. Thanks for your concern. It'll all be good. And I won't let her go. Because for a minute, she needs me to hold her. Because her son just got ran over by a car. And she's in prison. And she needs someone to hold her. The best the prison could do was strip her naked and put her in a rubber room. No, she needs me to hold her. I told the prison, don't you dare tell her what happened. Let me tell her. Don't you dare tell her. She will fall apart. Care enough about her existence that you don't tell her. Let me tell her. I know how to handle it. I got there and she's naked in a rubber room. Wants to die because it's all her fault. Because they told her your son was just killed. We're sorry. And she went ballistic. And condemnation ravaged her. And her life came before her and she didn't want to live. Why my son? It'd be better I die. If he's dead, then I don't want to live either. This stuff's real. 
I've been in so much of this stuff. I've been in the emergency room, rubber room. We're stripped down, folks. And you ain't allowed in there. The hospital psychologist is the only one allowed in there. By the law of the hospital. By law of the hospital. And somehow I get in them places. A little man let me in there one day and we couldn't find the little man. He wasn't nowhere around. But he had the key. (laughs) That boy needed me in that room. Jesus said, I'll put you in there. You're willing to go, I'll get you in. I sat with him and sat with him and sat with that naked boy. And I talked to him and talked to him. That nurse walked by and saw me. Head nurse, who are you? You're not one of the staff psychologists. No, ma'am, I'm a pastor. How did you get in here? You aren't permitted to be in here. You are not authorized. I'm thinking, girl, you don't get it. (laughs) You're living in another world than me right now. And I know where she's coming from and understand she's trying to do right, but she don't get it. And in a minute, she's going to because Jesus is Lord. You watch. She's scolding me and I'm pleasant and I'm just me. Ma'am, I didn't mean to buck anything. I stopped at the desk. I don't have the key. The, The man out there, the clerk at the desk left me in. What man left you in? The little elderly fella, probably 55. I don't know. He's the short little guy, dark hair. There's no one even on our staff with that description. I said, ma'am, he's right out at the desk. He walked me in and left me in. And I said, I'm not making this. How would I have got in here, honey? This door's security. You can't get in here. You have a code. Well, you need to take me to this man. I need to find out why he left you in here. We walked out there and that man ain't nowhere around. And I said, Jesus, you got me in trouble now. Because that man thinks, that woman thinks I'm lying about this man. And she wants to know. She wants answers. I looked at her and I said, honey, I love that kid in the room. I have a heart for him. Do you think it's possible God left me in there? Do you think that man could have even been a man? wonder if that man was an angel. An angel left Peter out of prison. Couldn't the man that looks like, an angel that looks like a man just left me in that room? I don't know. But I love that kid. And God's moving on his life. And he needs more than just psychology. He has roots. He has a foundation. He has inheritance. There's things invested in this boy. His life's more than his decision tonight. He's not a basket case. He just needs love. She looked at me and I watched her face as if the Spirit of God came and changed her. And she said, well, were you through with him? Are you finished? I said, no, I thought I was close but, but no, I wasn't finished, but I appreciate the time I had, ma'am. Thank you. No, sir, you go back in. You speak to him. I'll give you X amount of time, and when that time's up, you knock and we'll get you out. But just stay that amount of time. Yes, ma'am, I will honor that. Thank you, because I'm not good with time. You figured that out quick. <laughs> but in that moment, I need to be. So I went in there and I sat with him and I poured into him and I talked and I watched my clock like it was bondage. But it's honor. And I got up and I hugged him and loved on him and I wasn't done. I'm never done. I never know how to land the plane. And I ran to the door and I knocked. And there there was something. they, They knew I was there. And this nurse came running and she said, yes, sir. I said, look, the the head nurse, and I mentioned her name, She left me back in here to finish up with this fellow. Originally, she didn't think I was to be in here, but it all worked out. And she she just gave me X amount of time and told me to honor that time. So I'm just knocking out, you know, knocking myself out and doing what she asked. She said, well, are you finished with the young man? I said, ma'am, I'd stay in here with him for hours. He needs encouraged. He needs. She said, well, you knock when you're finished. It turned into no way should you be in here. To go back in and take X amount of time to you stay in as long as you need. That's why I'm the way I am, man. I could tell you story after story like that. I have never, ever walked into a prison and needed to show authorization. That's impossible. 
I went into one prison and they opened the door automatically. I took a whole worship team and set up and no one even patted us down, checked us or looked at us. If you go to prisons, you know what I'm telling you is impossible. I've held women like you're not supposed to hold women. But I'm allowed to because my heart is different. <laughs> oh, that feels so good. It's, honestly, I don't even care what you think about what I just said. I'm right. <laughs> and every once in a while, that woman needs... To be hugged so pure, so close, that it's secure, that it's life-giving, but it's so pure, it's ridiculous, it's out of the realm we've lived. It has nothing to do with holding a woman, it has to do with loving people. And you hold her like she's your own flesh and blood, and there's something amazing in that moment. And a prison doesn't even see it. You don't pastor in a community, pull up and put a prostitute in your car and drive away. Let me tell you why. Because of where the church is. It's the only reason you can. Because we think evil. And we fall apart and you already have me cheating and sleeping around and messing up. Just because you processed, hmm, prostitute, pull up, car, pull away. Oh, Dan, hypocrite, falling apart, messing around. Why doesn't love say, man, Dan is on a mission. I don't know who that lady is, but she is in for it now. <laughs> that girl got in his truck. No, but that uh, 90, I'm not being mean, 99.9% .9 of the mentalities in the church is calling a friend crying and saying, you ain't going to believe this, don't tell anybody, but I'm falling apart. Damn, I just saw Dan pick up a prostitute. And you believe the worst just because of what you saw. And you don't even know that I'm broken and bawling and trying to find Wanda at all cost. And ain't nothing, because guess what happened? I pulled up to the corner and the crack house is right there. I'm going to get out and I'm going in. And you ain't stopping me. I'm going in. And I ain't going for a fix. And I ain't going for a sexual advance. I'm going to find that girl. But the thing is, everybody you pass along the way has the same value of that girl. Wow. So I'm at home now. I'm right where I belong. And that prostitute peeks in my window. Hey, honey. What you doing in this part of town? And she's got her hands on my wound down window in the summer. She's leaning in my truck soliciting me. And she shouldn't mess with me right now. I'm full of emotion. The spirit of God's raging in me. I'm praying in tongues and I'm on a mission. And you don't come and try to pull me into prostitution and solicitation. You just leaned in the wrong truck. I ain't got some secret thing in my life. I ain't got some closet door. I ain't got some hidden desire. I ain't got some need for sexual gratification and some fantasy fulfillment. You're in the wrong window. I got her like a cobra. Did you ever see a cobra strike? I was, I beat a cobra. I'm bad in the Holy Ghost, man. I, just, I didn't even have to look. I just knew she was there. Poof. I had her wrist so quick. She couldn't get away. And words just come because of love. It's not a script. You're not reading a teaching lesson. You're for real. And you have words inside of you because love has a voice. And the prostitute says, hey, honey, what are you doing in these parts of town? Burst into tears. The question is, what are you doing in this part of town, dear? It's obvious to me you have no understanding of your value. God's created purpose for your life. For you to be down here is beyond my understanding because you're so much more. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to get away. And I got her. Did you ever see a raccoon in a trap? It's not the most pleasant picture for people that love animals. But they can't get out. <laughs> I had her, man. She leaned in the wrong window. <laughs> 
She said, who are you? You're still messed up. You have the wrong question. I know who I am. The question is, honey, who are you? That she would devalue you and dishonor your integrity and your human character just because you have an addiction that you would sink so low through that addiction that you would so teach yourself you're so worthless that you would give yourself to gratify some man's fantasy. And I just, bam! She was undone. She never met nothing like that. She met people playing the game. She met husbands sneaking around in the dark. She's met businessmen just looking for a quick advance with no commitment. That's all she knows. But now she's looking into the eyes of Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. See, I was brought up thinking that phrase was blasphemy that I just said, but you're wrong. I am the body of Christ. And he lives inside of me. And don't you tell me I can't look like him. You're way too late to deceive me. Religion has no power over me anymore. You ain't going to mess with me. The train's rolling. I told you this morning. You're going to hop on or get run over because it's rolling. And this is what you don't do. This is what is not allowed. I said, look at me. I'm looking for so and so. I know you know her. Don't you play me. Her life is just as valuable as yours and I'm going to find her. I love her and it's not a domestic love. It's the love of God. I'm not her boyfriend. I'm her pastor. And I will find her. Help me find her. Get in my car and take me to her. Never even thought I was putting a prostitute in my car. If you think about it, don't do it. Did you get it? If you think about it, don't do it. Just get directions. (laughs) And then drive away like this. In case anybody's watching. But I didn't think about it, Gary. I was blind. It was was in the moment. Passion. And you say, boy, that was zeal without knowledge. No, it was love in action. Jesus will protect me. He will protect the souls of men. Jesus is amazing. Come on, the accuser of the brethren. Isn't bigger than the love of God. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I didn't even think about it. I said get in my car. Please take me to him. Or take me to her. She jumps in my car. We're driving down the street. And I'm looking everywhere. She said would you stop being so conspicuous. Would you just quit looking around. You need. You can stop looking so obvious. I said honey. I stopped living in the shadows a long time ago. You're used to slinking around in the dark. And it's unnatural for you to live in the open. But I've come out into the light. And I'm not going to hide anymore. And she's just like, you could tell I was getting on her. Like, who is this guy? She points her out. She's working out of an alleyway. Two dealers pimping her out of an alleyway. So she can do a little advance to get a hit of crack. Breaks your heart, huh? Ah, I just cry. So this lady says, this prostitute says, you can't drop me off on the street corner. They'll see me get out of your truck. And, and then if you go back, they'll know that I ratted her out. I'll take heat for it. I said, I'm not here to put heat on you, honey. I'm here to love you. What do you need me to do? I need you to take me around back and pull me into the alley. That doesn't look cool and natural. Pastor Dan's truck pulling in the alley with the prostitute. Now I'm in the dark outside of the streetlight zone. And now we're in an alley. And I don't do anything quick. I don't just drop her off. I can't. I love her. So in your mind, I'm back there long enough for anything. Are you following me? I wouldn't let her out of my truck. I grabbed her arm again. I said, be honest with me. Why are you working these streets? I'm doing it for my babies. I got to support my babies. I said, stop lying to me, honey. You could work at Walmart and support your babies. You have an addiction. Just be honest. Look at me. I told her who she was. I explained the gospel. I wrote a name and number to a women's rehab and I handed it to her. And she said, why do you care so much about me? Because I know who you are. Come here, girl. And in the dark alley, she fell on me and I held her and rocked her. 
and held her. I'm going to be bold. Held her like no man has ever held her. What an honor. (laughs) And you say I'm wrong and I say you're wrong. I'm saying you got religion working on you. And you don't understand love. And you're thinking too technical. (laughs) The pure in heart. They'll see God. I read another verse on the pure. Somewhere around Titus. To the pure. All things. Are pure. Then why are we thinking evil? I guess we're not as pure as we sing. <laughs> Come on, I'm on this thing right now. Why are we thinking evil? <laughs> Probably need some purity. <laughs> See, nobody's going to touch me in that position because I'm in that position. It's the Holy Ghost. She needs that experience. I held her and I prayed over her like she was my own daughter. I kissed her on the forehead. She's crying. She's sweating. She might have hepatitis. Greater is he that is in me. And wonder if I really do believe that. (laughs) That's a good way for that thing to die. Let it get on me a little. (laughs) Man, I feel this gospel all over me right now. I hope I'm not scaring you. I've crawled into car accidents that came out with their blood all over me. And I don't even think about it in the moment because love doesn't think that stuff. I was telling these guys, I watched some amazing miracles with metal crushed, people crying, moaning, screaming, and blood everywhere. And I've watched the gospel come in and change things because you love not your own life unto death. You ain't afraid of getting contaminated. The gospel overruns everything. Vulnerability is fear. You're created to subdue, not be subdued. Natural knowledge, natural human knowledge has eaten most of our lunches. And we're subject to the world we live in. And I have good news for you. You're subject to the one that lives inside of you. (laughs) And if you ever get that, it'll change your world. And you won't be afraid of the air you're breathing, the water you're drinking. You won't be next in line. You won't be preventative. You'll be gospel. Go ahead and still eat healthy and live in self-control. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I promise you, you won't be next in line. You won't have a grid for that. You follow me? Church vulnerability is fear. People die of secondhand smoke because they believe they can. We've been hurt so bad by cancer, it's touched everyone in this room at some level. That it's gained notoriety, and somehow we feel like we're vulnerable and we're next. So we're doing things to prevent it, and in the process, you're proclaiming you're next in line. Which means you fear cancer. (laughs) You can take your cancer back to hell. Where it belongs. And I'm going to keep going after this. And get a deeper authority. And a greater revelation. I'm going to watch it die under my hand. More than I've ever seen it before. And I've seen it die a bunch. But I've lost some good folks to that wretched thing. That doesn't mean I'm positioned for it. I'm positioned to destroy it. You're not afraid remember. It's never about death. And you love not your own life. You're never afraid in the gospel. Because you're never going to (laughs) die. Now that's what a believer believes. Or you covet this natural life and incorporate God into it and hope he saves it, preserves it, makes it better. And then your whole purpose is you. Come on, I got on some stuff. I don't even know why I do what I do. I am so out in left field right now from where I thought I was going. I don't know what I'm doing, man. (laughs) Gary, I didn't read the manuscript. I don't have a clue, man. You guys are right with me. I'm falling apart, man. I got on this stuff. See, I woke up in bed one morning and God said, 
His heart sounded sad to me. He expressed emotion. He said, my people are vulnerable in the world in which they live. And I created them to be to subdue, not be subdued by it. Creation is groaning for the sons of God to rise up. We always think that's miracles. No, that's actually to bring the blessing back on the earth that it was created under and stop seeing it as cursed. The sons of God that walk without fear, the sons of God that walk invulnerable, the John G. Lakes of the earth that can bury the bubonic plague victims and not have any grid for human protection and just understand the law of the spirit of life through Christ and the British Red Cross is like, man, you're out of your mind. He says, no, let me show you. And he puts the live germs on his hand and under their microscope, they race and die. No wonder he's still standing. We've called it sovereignty, selection, choice, God's will. Some die. So we made God an emperor. And I bet the kingdom of God is at hand and he's given us keys. We probably ought to open some doors and close some doors. Lock some forever and leave some open. You've been given authority. You have a sword. If everything is God, then why do you have all that power in your tongue? (laughs) If everything's God, why do you reap what you sow? If everything's God, why are we destroyed for the lack of knowledge? Think with me, we've sold into religious theology stuff. And the biggest destructive thing on the earth is, well, God allowed, well, God's in total control. God wills life and people die. He didn't ordain you to kill someone and go to prison for your life. You did that. It wasn't God's plan for your life. Why don't we think a little bit about what we sold into? We've sold really cheap, man. Well, God allowed. And now you have no permission to fight because it's all the will of God. So now you're disarmed and unarmed. It's all reduced to sovereignty. And there's no fight now in the Christian. So why speak to the mountain? God put it there. And if he wants it to move, he'll move it. So just be passive, que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. It's demonic lies. It's not scriptural. He put decree in your mouth. He said, you decree and it shall come to pass. You believe and whatsoever you believe, asking, praying, you shall receive it. He didn't say according to my sovereign administrative choice. He says, I've put truth in you. Proclaim it, live it, and steward the earth. And stop blaming everything on me. What a cop out to just blame everything on God. Now Christians are mad at God because God took my children and God needed another angel. And we don't even know what to tell them because we're so caught up in the sovereignty that we're even confused about God and he's a mystery. So we can't really lift our hands and praise him because we're confused by him. But yet we got to honor him because he's God, you know. Come on, guys. I don't know how I get on this, but man, I'm there. I love God. He's not killing our children. He's not ordaining disaster. He's not putting cancer on your loved ones to teach them character. (laughs) Scripture after scripture proves it. And yet we fight over this stuff. And the average believer, the average mind in the believer, pawns off God aloud while God's in control. As if he's at an administrative desk calling everything that happened today. That is unscriptural. If that was true, there's no thief killing, stealing, and destroying. It's all the sovereign choice of God. If that's true, there'd be no reason to pray and change things because it's going to be the way God wants it. If that's true, there's no reason to have the power of death and life in your tongue because no matter what you say, it's the way God administrated. Come on. We have bought it. It's in my opinion, which isn't always safe to say, but in my opinion, I'm being honest. It's the most destructive belief in the body of Christ. Because it takes the fight out of the believer. And it sells him short. And it misinterprets God. And now he's a puzzle that we can't solve. Come on. You really think about what I'm saying. And you know what I'm saying is telling the truth because it's creating that in our minds if we think that way. 
God's puzzling now. <laughs> you guys all right? I've been wanting to talk about intimacy. and I've been wanting to read Colossians 3 in good faith. I'm already turned there. And lo and behold, it's still in my Bible. <laughs> it's still there, man. I don't know. I get on these things, man. I just, I don't apologize for them. I, I, feel, I feel like they're on purpose. Don't be conformed to the world. Romans 12. Don't be conformed to the world, but be. How are you going to be transformed? By the. Why is it important to renew your mind? So you can prove. The good, acceptable, perfect will of God, which I believe isn't three different wills. It's the progressive. His will's good. It's acceptable. It's perfect. Simple. Keep it simple. It's not permissive, submissive. It's not all that stuff. We get so technical and so confusing. You got to teach for three weeks to explain. His will's good. And because it's good, it's acceptable. And it's perfect. Why aren't we conformed to the way the world's thinking? Because we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Why is it important to renew our minds? So we can prove and understand and know the will of God. Because faith is found where the will of God is known. If the will of God's not known, you just have need and you're driven by it. And you reduce the gospel to principles you're applying to get help. And there's no relationship. There's no love. You're just in need. And any man can pray when he's in trouble. Even if he doesn't believe God, he'll wing it and take a shot. He's got nothing to lose. How many people make a mad dash for God in crisis? Any man can pray in need. I wonder if faith was, is found when you have every opportunity to not believe in front of you. I wonder if Bartimaeus, when he cries out to God, Jesus is teaching to something because it looks like he ignores him and keeps on walking. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Sounds like he qualifies. All the call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, give a minute here. Be patient. When he calls Jesus son of David, it's a messianic term. He was saying, I believe you're the Christ. I believe you're the Savior. He cries out, and what's Jesus do? Apparently just keeps walking and doesn't address him. He ignores him because the people tried to hush Bartimaeus. And they said, man, stop calling out for him and making this scene. Come on, stop. Well, you can add to that without speculating. You know, they, they're rationalizing. Look, if he wanted you healed, he'd have healed you by now. Look, he'd have stopped in the first place. You wouldn't even had to ask him. He already would. Have. You'd have, he, look, if I, hush up, man. There's other people with need. They're trying to silence him like he's out of order. And in his heart, he's saying, no, he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's my sight. He's salvation. He's my redemption. Hush, are you kidding me? This is my moment. Now is the time. Now is the day. He's passing by. Jesus! What was he faced with? Every reason not to believe. Look, when he's passing by, anybody can cry out. When you have need, because you hope he stops. You hope he answers. You hope it works. But when people tell you to hush, when he walks by and people say, well, look, if he wanted you healed, he'd already healed you. You wouldn't even have to ask. He knows all things. Why are you even praying? If he wanted you healed, you, in fact, if he wanted you healed, you wouldn't be sick in the first place. That's the way people talk. It sounds like the devil talking to Eve in the garden. Exactly. Rational and human reasoning. And the more you think and impose to know the heart of God, and the next thing you know, it makes sense. Now we got what's called the way that seems right. And that way is death. <sighs> so why am I going to get renewed? So I can prove God's will. We throw the will of God around like a hot potato. Who can know the will of God? The Bible says don't be unwise. Know the will of the Lord. Hebrews or Ephesians 5.17. Romans says, get renewed in your mind so you can prove his will. Jesus said, I'm the will of God revealed. Look to me and you know God's will. So if you can't find your belief system in the life of Jesus, throw it out. Your belief system. Throw it out of your belief system. If what you say about God isn't found in the life of Jesus, you've been taught wrong. Because he's the new and living. He's the New Testament covenant of God. He's the expressed image of his person and the outraying of his brightness. And he said, when you see me, you've already seen him. 
He's the, invisible, he's the visible image of the invisible God. They're all scriptures. Colossians 1.15, Hebrews chapter 1, John 14. How is it that you, have I been with you so long you don't even know me, Philip? If, when you've seen me, you've already seen me. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. No one, no one. How many people? No one has seen God at any time except the only begotten who's in the bosom of the Father. And He has declared Him to us. We say, well, God heals some and doesn't heal all. Jesus didn't declare that. Life suggested that. <laughs> we say, well, it probably wasn't the timing of God. It wasn't the will of God. Jesus didn't say that. Life suggested that. So we write a manual, 30 reasons why men aren't healed and keep it in our back pocket and have a ceiling over the kingdom of God. And we have a reason why it won't happen. Jesus didn't have the manual in his pocket. Why? It was never his experience. We only wrote the book to explain away our experience. Jesus didn't have a manual, 30 reasons why men aren't healed. He gave you a reason why they can be. We're trying to explain away what we feel bad about. It's at the cost of truth and truth makes us free. Now we have a problem. If you embrace one thing on that Christian list of 30, you've just limited the advancement of the kingdom of God. And you've just put a ceiling over your own growth. And now that one reason can stop the power of God that's in the believer because the sign follows the believer, not the person in need. So if you were an enemy, wouldn't you try to get to the believer and get them to not be sure what they believe and get them self-conscious and get them to fight over something? <laughs> I was in a funeral service. I was asked to do a funeral. You just don't want to invite me to that stuff if you want traditional stuff, man. I don't do anything normal. You ought to see me do a wedding. It's scary. It's so passionate. It's so real. It's so fun. But I don't do weddings anymore because I just can't. I don't. It's a di my life's a different grace. I can't do weddings. It's just, I, I need to be with the, the couple. There's a great accountability in marriage. I won't just marry because you say you're in love. I, I, there's responsibility. If I'm on the pulpit, I don't have to do a wedding. I'm not ordained to do weddings. God doesn't say you marry people. Actually, in the days, right, of the coming of the Son of Man, it'll be like in the days of Noah when men are marrying and giving in marriage, needing and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. It's, it's not just something, well, wow, you're getting married. No, it's covenant. It's love. And you've got to really be accountable. And when you stand up there, it's because you believe that this is the will of God, the timing of God, and they're ready. And you give them every reason to win. But I'm not in that grace anymore. I travel a lot. But I tell people, they ask me to do weddings all the time, and I always tell them no. And for a while, my heart got jerked back and forth because I took time and invested and then saw people just do things that you just couldn't even imagine. Like leave their spouse and be with somebody else and stuff. And you poured into them and you married them in the Holy Ghost. And, and that stuff wrenches your heart and, and it, it affects you. So you have to grow through that. It's not why I don't do weddings. I, I don't, I'm just not in a grace to do them, but I tease people. They ask me to do weddings. I said, man, and I'm really sorry because I, I believe I do like the most amazing wedding in the world. And they're like, duh! Well, I'm going to pray Jesus visits you and tells you to marry us. And, but I talk, I'm real. I talk to the couple and I'm talking to them, and then I come around in front of them, and I talk to the people and bring them right into what's about to happen, and God's doing all kinds of stuff. It's so awesome. That's how I do funerals. I just don't know how to be normal. So I'm doing this funeral with this fella, and I'm in the middle of, of sharing in the gospel, and I went, I smelled in the spirit. And I smelled animosity in and I smelled division and pride. And I felt people truly mourning. And I felt people gloating. In the death of a man. I felt all that in the room. And I said, guys. I just perceived something in this room. And now I have to address it. And I addressed it. And you should have heard me talk. You ain't never seen me that way. I said, how dare we? Be so proud and arrogant and audacious on the day of honoring a past loved one and remembering his life that half this room would gloat because your theology got proved in his death. And the other half mourned because you felt like your theology got disproved and were failing to even see the honor of the life that's hanging in the balance here. And there was a side of the room saying, well, I knew he would die. It's not just God's will to heal people all the time. Well, no wonder he died. He just need to face reality and see. 
See, he died. So it wasn't the will of God for him to live. Look, he died. Well, there was a man in the Bible in Hebrew, Matthew 17 that wasn't healed of epilepsy. And it was the will of God that he be healed. But he wasn't when his men prayed. And Jesus said, it's because of what you fail to see. It had nothing to do with the will of God. So why do we teach the will of God? Jesus didn't say it was the will of God. He said, you guys need to get better understanding. I'll get with the program. I'm going to hand you this baton soon. and You're going to have to be the body of Christ. So you've got to get this. And I'll show you again. Bam. And he heals the guy. Was it the will of God that that boy be healed? She's not leaving because of my preaching. She told me she had to go on a date with her husband. So nobody else is allowed to leave. It's not my preaching. I'm preaching too good. Don't leave. Oh, no, ma'am. You can't go. You can't sneak out. Hey, no. Come back. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be neat if she just came back and <laughs> floated? <laughs> she just snuck out on me. Nobody else. You hear me? <laughs> I'm having fun. I'm doing this funeral, and there's so much dogma, so much animosity, so much division, so much arguing over doctrine that when a man passes, we're so desensitized to the fact that this man passed in the honor of his life that we're too busy gloating in the fulfillment or mourning in the failure of our proclaimed belief system at, at, in the death of a brother, family member. And I smelled that in the spirit and didn't know the family and discerned it. It must have been important to Jesus. It must have been a stench. It must have been a bad smell. Because the smell that's a sweet fragrance to God is one of selflessness. Sweet fragrance, selflessness. Not, that, that is a stench. That's like garbage. That's like landfill. Serious. And God was tired of smelling it. He didn't want to smell that in his people because they're called to smell better. And he just told me to clean them up. He gave me great boldness. So I went after it. But I wielded a big sword. It was sharp. I was cutting some fish, girl. We was filleting. I, I, and I wasn't mad at him. My heart was broken. That we have the capacity to go to church and live from a heart like that. And think we're doing the Christian thing at the cost of one another. At the expense of truth. That's tragic. How easy we can sell cheap. And go through the Christian motion. And be way out of bounds. You following me? Don't you let that stuff in your heart. Just because a man dies doesn't mean God's will was proved. I wonder if it means we all need to grow more. Why don't we see the dead raised? We're probably still busy fearing it. How do you have authority over something you fear? Why aren't we seeing more cancers here? I wonder if we're fearing it and feeling like, oh no, here we go. It was so painful when Billy died. Now Johnny has it and then Sally. And all of a sudden, we're just in turmoil, and now we're praying because we're going to lose more brothers and sisters. And the only reason we're praying is because we're scared they're going to die. And we all fast because we're afraid, and it ain't works. He already finished that work. And we wave another flag, blow an extra shofar, and think we did everything possible, and they still die. So now we just settle and say our minds are confused. It just mustn't be God's will to heal. And the bottom line is we're driven by the notoriety of the disease because it's hurt us emotionally, sentimentally, empathetically. Come on, get real with me. Just because a thousand people pray for somebody and they die doesn't mean it wasn't the will of God. You say, well, somebody had to have a mustard seed. My Bible says if you believe, you'll say the mountain, it'll move, period. Period. That's what the Bible says. So when are we just going to honor the Bible and stop boasting our experience above the word? If he's magnified his word above his name, we probably magnify his word above how we feel and what we think. If Jesus told his own disciples they could have healed the epileptic boy and that they need to get greater understanding, I bet he's talking to us too. But we're more content to sit at a coffee table and talk doctrine instead of get alone with God, lay on our face, and let him ravage us. No, I'm being real. And it's called arrogance, church. And a lot of the people that are debating this have no Christian testimony, very little experience, and never even seen the power of God move. Look, I haven't seen enough, but I've seen way too much to get caught in a debate with you. I love you way too much to sit there and diminish the revelation to a debate at a coffee table. A Christian debate. <laughs> a Bible study where we just talk about the Lord. No, no, no. You gather together, you have the initiative to become more like him, not just discourse Bible history. Come on, I'm being real about this. See, I say stuff like that and then people say, well, he doesn't believe in Bible studies. 
I didn't say that. <laughs> I don't believe you wrapping your identity around a talk at the coffee table, puffed up in knowledge, is the answer. Come on, drunks at the bar talk about God for hours. <laughs> I'm just being real. Go to Colossians 3. <laughs> I'm just in a gear, man. I am, I am. I'm going there. Who said, am I sure? Did you say, am I sure? Pray for me, pull for me. Come on. <laughs> Guys, we've been called into intimacy and relationship with God. We're not just called to live a life of faith. We're not just called to serve the Lord or doctrine. We're called into intimacy in the fellowship of the Son. The greatest ability you possess in the grace of God is to be with Him, not heal the sick. What surpasses everything you'll ever do in the Christian life is the ability to be with Him. The ability to be one with Him, to have your face unveiled, to know Him and to be known by Him. It's the greatest blessing of your life isn't to serve the Lord, it's to know the Lord. In Mark 3, it says he called them to himself that he wanted. Well, no man comes to God unless he's drawn. Your life can seem like it's in a mess. You can have things that are spiraling. You can be backsliding. You can snowball. You can repeat things that you sure you were free from. And next thing you know, you repeat it and go, duh. And you're freaking out and it's eating you up because you don't want to repeat it, right? Well, there's a good start there. Your heart's changed. You're for real. And you won't change. You see what I mean? So you can't let that thought keep you from his presence. The fact that you care means he's drawing you. Because nobody comes to him unless he's drawn. You wouldn't have a care in the world towards the things of God if he wasn't ministering to your heart and whispering and wooing. If the grace of God wasn't saying, Psst, over here, son. No, 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 you're more than that. Hey, that's not your answer. That'll never help you. No, 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 not again. I love you. You're more. You're more. And you're like, huh, eh, huh. And you're like, Psst. oh, man, what do I do? Psst, I love you. Yeah, I love you. Come on, you wouldn't have the ability to cry and feel sorry in your heart if God wasn't drawing you. I'm telling you, you'd be blind and you'd be whatever and no one could even reach you and you'd walk off into darkness and be destroyed. It's the sovereignty of God. The true sovereignty of God is that every drunk driver doesn't die. Every man doesn't sin and drop dead. That's the sovereignty of God. That's the sovereignty of God. That's God being in sovereign control of the earth. It's mercy triumphing over judgment. It's blood speaking better things than that old covenant. <laughs> That's sovereignty, guys. Let's get it straight. It's not God administratively orchestrating a sickness and then you praying all His promises and Him saying, look, I've changed my mind. I know what I wrote in the book, but I'm God. I'm bigger than that book. You need to understand. I'm the Lord. You're not. Your little peanut brain can't assess it. And you just have to understand it. But Lord, you said, I know what I said. But let me be God, and in this situation, I, if God treated us that way, it would be a short time till he taught us to never take him at his word. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He wants you to never take God as his word. If you parented your children like that, it would be child abuse. You would teach them to never take you at your word. And yet, we'll make God that way. You think God reserves the right to change his mind. His word is infallible, unchangeable, lasts forever. If he says, I forgive all your sin and heal all your disease, there is a grace to step into that. There is something to grow into. It is there, church. And he can't reserve the right to say, not in this case. Because then he's teaching you that the promises aren't promises. He's teaching you that his will isn't really set. And now we're reduced to hope so instead of no so. 
And then we'll live like this instead of rock solid. And if Jesus ever gave you one other example, you'd have nothing to believe. You'd just be in need. So why do we make God what Jesus didn't express? If just one time Jesus said, I'd like to, but I can't, it's not the will of God to heal you. We would never, ever again know the will of God to heal. Ever. We'd still pray. But we'd never know the will of God. My Bible says the prayer of faith, not prayer. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. My Bible says if you believe, you will lay. You will. You will. If you believe, you will lay your hands on the sick. What's the evidence you believe in your hands on the sick? If your hands aren't on the sick, you just don't believe God will heal through you. Because if you lay hands on the sick, you believe he will. We're so worried about the healing and will he and won't he and wonder if he doesn't and I'm going to look foolish and I'm going to risk everything. And we get our heads so full of stuff we never even reach out our hand and prove we don't believe. We're so busy thinking about it we pull back. Just get your hands on somebody. Just get your hands on somebody. Because the sign of a believer before healing is that you'll get your hands on somebody and you'll pray and they shall be healed. Well, I didn't see anything change. So why are you letting that be your deciding factor? See, I was in services, plantar fasciitis. You know what it is? It's a foot thing, pain, hurt. In the morning, it's really hard to get out of bed and walk. It's like, ooh. I have never, I had never up even to this point that, that, I, that I did this, had never seen it not healed in a church service. It was one of them things like fiber miles, as I see, just go. There's things I see just leave a lot. And people say, you got special anointing for that. No, you've just built a confidence. You, you understand he's Lord in those areas. You've seen it, and it's like, yeah. And it's just, you know. So the plantar fasciitis, never seen it not healed in the service. And I'm in Walmart, and this lady, and I said, honey, what's wrong with your feet? You're really protecting your steps. You're, are you in pain? Oh, it's plantar fasciitis. I said, whoa. I said, honey, let me just tell you something, man. I've been privileged to travel the country and pray and pray for the sick. I usually don't go this route, but I'm just telling you, I've never seen that thing not healed in a service. Jesus loves you. He'll take that pain out of you. I want to pray for you. Can we pray? She said, well, you can pray. So I prayed and I'm like, your feet. No, they really hurt. What? They don't hurt, do they? Yeah. Okay. Can I pray again? Yeah. This is years ago. Can I pray for you? Or I check your feet. No, they're the same. I'm like, bah, 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 bah. your mind just wants to flip out because you're like, Ugh, I've never seen this thing not healed. I just put my words out there. I just put my foot in my mouth, it seems. It just All this stuff tried to hit me. And I said, honey, I, man, I said, thank you for the honor of praying for you. I'm just going to bless you one more time. I don't want to keep you here all day. She said, no, I can tell you're really sincere and you really mean well. And I'm like, some people say, thanks for trying. I'm like, thanks for trying. Ah! <laughs> So, so, uh, uh, so, so I prayed one more time and I blessed her and I left. And I'll, I'll be honest, I was puzzled. I was like, Joe, why do you bump into stuff? Why? Oh, and I had to walk myself through that. Father, you're amazing. It's your will to heal. Man, she's not a statistic. At it. Man, oh, it's not like I'm, you know, 42 and one. <laughs> Stupid. But we go there sometimes. Look, you could be 0 and 16. And you better pray for number 17 because you believe. Just don't tell them you're 0 and 16. Because nobody's keeping track. Just pray. It ain't about 0 and 16. It's about truth. And wonder if the fact that you're praying for number 17 is making such a loud statement over your soul that you're actually rising above your lack of results and you're saying, I don't understand, but I understand one thing. It's the will of God and I'm anointed. I wonder if you have to get past all reasoning and get past all rationale and all the church's religion and just reach out and touch number 17 and cross some kind of line and make some kind of statement in your own soul and just break through all that rhetoric. Wonder if. And wonder if it ain't. Now I'm one for 17. No, you're on your way. And a whole lot more people are going to get blessed. So I prayed for this man. I seen this man. I said, what's going on with you, man? He said, I got plantar fasciitis. I said, God, I just prayed for this lady. I'm puzzled. And the next guy I prayed for has got plantar fasciitis. I said, what? 
I said, dude, I'm thinking redemption. I'm, I'm bannying up again. You know, I'm like, we're going for this thing. I want to beat this thing down. So we pray. How's your feet? Same. Duh! Let me pray again, man. Shh. How's your feet? Same. Duh! Me and Todd used to do that all the time. We had to really get a grown up. We like bulldogs. Todd's funny. He would be praying. How you doing, man? It's the same. We're like praying and grunting. He's like, we need more, dude. We just need more, God. <laughs> it's like the tenth time we prayed, and they're like, "You guys are really going for it." <laughs> you have no idea. <sighs> God, you love them. Gee, hey. <laughs> we got a good grip on some things along the way, but this was way back when this happened. I bet it was a month or so. I don't know total chronological time frame, but it was a while later. I bumped into this lady, and I'm talking to her. And I said. She said, hey, I know you. I've met you. You, you. I said, did I pray for you? She said, yeah. I said, I, I thought, I probably figured I prayed for you. You did look familiar, honey. I just love a lot of people. I pray for a lot of people. She said, well, no, it was funny because she said, I had plantar fasciitis. I said, I remember you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I'm ready to go for that thing, man. I just want to get her feet, man. She said, I remember you. It's fun. This is good stuff. It builds your heart. She said, she said, you prayed for me and nothing. I said, no, I remember. Yeah, it still hurt. And you prayed like three times. Yeah, yeah, I know, honey. Oh, I know. I know. I get it. <laughs> she told me the whole story and, re and I relived it. <laughs> no, I'm just having fun with y'all. She said, you know, it was amazing. I didn't think a whole lot about it. I just thought it was a nice gesture. I thought, well, that was sincere. I could tell you were sincere. I'm really glad I ran into you. I didn't know if I'd ever see you again. So I went home, did my normal things and family and supper, and I went to bed. Sir, I woke up in the morning. I have never had a pain in my feet since. I'm walking around in turmoil. And God's saying, faith isn't a point in time. It's not a hit, miss, win, or lose. You ain't risking nothing. He said, faith is spelled R-S-K. Faith is believing God. I ain't taking no risk. I ain't playing roulette. I believe in God. I'm, I'm learning this stuff, right? Guess who else I bumped into within a week? Pretty easy to figure out, huh? Guess what his story was? Exactly the same, and I just cry. I'm like, God, you're teaching me. Thanks for fathering me. I'm done putting my mind through all that gauntlet rat race junk. Now I'm just going to be free to love. I am free to dance. I am free. You know, you just got to put love in there. I am free to love. <laughs> Amen? And I'm just not going to put myself in that turmoil. And when I lay on my bed at night, those people can come back to my memory. And I can say, Father, thank you for the honor of having something to give them today. Sincere love. I gave you to them. I released the kingdom over them. And I thank you that you're touching their bodies. And I thank you you're bringing restoration. God, thank you. And you just sincerely believe in God. Boy, that sure beats turmoil. And then bumping into them a month later and finding out everything was cool. I want to teach you this and then we're just going to wrap this thing up quick. Yeah, we'll just, I'll just try to be done by three because we're coming back again. I think you guys, are, some of you might come back. I'm coming. I'll be all right too. I'm actually going to try to squeeze a jog in today. I'm a runner. I ran five miles yesterday. We marked it. It was five miles. Yeah, I passed a squished water moccasin on the road. I said, you guys got water moccasin. I was fascinated, man. I was like, ah, I wanted to see a live one. I just wanted to mess with him. I didn't want to pick him up and handle serpents. I just, I just, you know, I'm down south. I'm a Christian. I'm going to pick up a moccasin. No, I just, I'm fascinated by nature, man. I, I saw, we don't have moccasins at home. That thing was laying there on the road. I thought, buddy, you didn't look both ways. You didn't, li you didn't listen to parents, man. You're a 
So I'd always look both ways when you cross. That, that dude didn't have no upbringing, man. He just... <laughs> a dead one. <laughs> well, snakes freak people out. I, I, I've always kind of been fascinated by them, but, but, but he, he was big. Yeah. I ran by him, and I just, at first glance, I just thought it was a black snake. We got them everywhere back home, and I said, that wasn't no black snake. That thing is thick. It just didn't look like it. And I went back, and I realized it was a water moccasin. I thought, whoa, you got water moccasins here. And I started looking at all them little water ditches and ponds and started thinking about my upbringing. I was always running around in the swamps. And I guess you got to be a little bit thinking they might be laying anywhere, huh? That was just fun to me. And we saw a king snake on the road today. They're pretty. It was green. had black all through it. It was beautiful. We turned around, went back to look at it. I'm like a little kid with that stuff, huh? I don't know, he's a Christian, he's going to pick it up. <laughs> Go ahead, man, bite me, bite me. <laughs> See, man, you ain't got nothing on me. <laughs> That's not, not, not. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be afraid if I got bit, but I'm going to teach you that because I don't want you to try to do that thing. Do you know this is the truth? I don't preach how I live from the pulpit ever. A lot of people wouldn't understand how I live, and a lot of people would... Respect me and try to do it instead of become it. Did you get that? There's some ways I live that people feel like they have to contest. Leave me alone. I'm all right. Oh, yeah, but you got to use wisdom. I am. That phrase comes most of the time because we're afraid. You've got to use wisdom to stop the power of God more times than we realize. One day we'll see. But yeah, but you've got to use wisdom. I am. I'm all right. Look in my eyes. We look at the outward and we see what a man's going through. And we say, yeah, but how, why are you going through this? You ain't all right. Look what, how can the devil do this to you? How can he touch you? Do you ever hear that phrase? How can he touch you? You've got to look past the flesh. You've got to look into the eyes and see if he's touching it. Just because I can't use my leg in the moment doesn't mean he's touching me. You better take a closer look. My leg doesn't determine me. You better take a deeper look than my leg. <laughs> if you look in my eyes, you're going to see I'm all right. <laughs> Are you getting that? Yeah, but brother, you got to use wisdom. I am. Shh. I appreciate you love me, but I don't need your sentiments right now. I see you. I'm going to have you. I'll be all right. You follow me? The only reason they're talking to you like that is because they like you. And they're concerned for your welfare. So it's not that they're evil. They just don't understand. When I went through witchcraft, every pastor and leader in my life told me what I was. Told me I was in pride, ashamed to go to the doctor. That I didn't want to ruin my testimony and the message God put in my heart. I said, am I thinking that stuff? I don't even know that stuff. I don't even, I didn't even have the capacity to think that. I'm just okay. Jesus is Lord. He raised from the dead. It's demonic. I don't need 911. I don't need a diagnosis. Jesus is Lord. It's a devil. We're going to win. Because he already won. It's okay, guys. And they're like, no, you're in spiritual pride. You're in denial, brother. Every spiritual leader in my life told me that. Men I respect. Why? Because they crossed over into human sympathy and they really like me and they were trying to help me in the flesh. They said, yeah, but Dan, look at your leg. I said, when do you ever preach that from the pulpit? You get the drum beat going, you get the piano keys flowing and you get your voice ramped up and you say, man does never live by what he sees. Boom, 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 boom. But he looks at the things that are unseen. Because those things that you see are subject to change, but the unseen is eternal. Boom, boom. That's what we do in church. We hype it up and don't even believe what we're saying. And when the doors close and you care about me, you're going to tell me what you would never preach in public. You tell me all these amazing stories in children's church. Blow my little kid mind, man. 
in a well for three days and no acid burn and go and cough him up and be all right. <laughs> Crazy stuff. This guy pours water all over the sacrifice, calls on the Lord, and this tongue of fire comes down and licks up the water and goes poof, like it was gas. And you're going to tell me all that stuff when I'm a little kid and get me to believe all these crazy supernatural stories. And then when I'm old enough to believe them and want to apply them, you tell me to get wisdom. I guess we ought to get back to that little child and see the kingdom. Do you know what the gist is there? Unless you become like a little child, you know what that means? Get back to your place of innocence. Because you've left the old world scar you and corrupt you and take away your innocence. Your ability to just believe. Now don't do this to your kids. It's messed up. But if they're two, if they're three, and maybe even if they're four, they'll bite on this. Oh my goodness, look at that elephant out there. He was pink. Where, Daddy? Oh, didn't you see him in the field? No, go back. I want to see the pink elephant. They ain't thinking pink elephant. Yeah, right. It's not because they're stupid. They have innocence and they believe your word. We've taught God in such a way that we don't know who he is. We don't know what he's thinking. We think he's schizophrenic. We think he needs some kind of something. There's folks in the church that say, well, I can't wait to get to God because I've got a few things I'll sort out and ask him that day when I get to the Lord. Friend, you're going to be glad you're alive and ain't dust and you're going to fall on your face and honor him. You ain't going to know what to do. He's amazing. You think you're going to walk into heaven and settle some scores. You're going to take one look into his fiery eyes of light and love and realize you've been deceived, been proud. You're going to fall on your face and cry and be glad there's mercy. That's just it, man. Come on. You ain't walking into heaven to set something straight. Well, I got something to settle with God. <laughs> you better done get that settled now or be glad you don't pop in his presence someday. Walking in with that kind of pride, you're going to blow up. Implode. <laughs> Little dust particles. And God just put the puzzle back together. <laughs> it ain't going to work for you. You got the wrong idea. He's almighty amazing. Just think of getting in the presence of God, looking into his eyes of love, and realizing in the moment that you lived a life of unbelief because you blamed it on others. Can you imagine looking in the eyes of Jesus and going, Oh, Lord, I believed you if it wasn't for my spouse. You ain't even going to be able to think that. You're going to look in his eyes and know you were deceived. But on the earth, you let that work. <laughs> Man, if it wasn't for my job, God, I prayed and prayed. You never gave me. I thought I was getting that other job. You know, I'd have been more if it wasn't. I don't <laughs> you ain't going to be able to think that stuff. You're going to look into his eyes of light and go, oops, and fall on his mercy. He's amazing. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble going here. Okay. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Don't applaud. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. I'm going to try. It's so chock full, and my goal was six minutes. <laughs> oh, God. You don't even believe that, Jennifer. I have scarred you already. You, there is no faith coming out of you. In fact, I feel fumes of unbelief just flooding the front. They always say the front is the most anointed place. Right now, there's so much unbelief, it's ridiculous. You just cut it and just serve it. It's all coming out of her. Mrs. Pastor. Unbelievable. You ought to feel it. And the more I talk, it's just pouring out of her. And she's laughing now because, see, now my six minutes is down to five, and she's got me because I'm so distracted. And that's, now it's just really unbelief. You ought to feel it. It's like, you going down, boy. 
<laughs> she said, I'm right. <laughs> I still feel it. It's kind of, <laughs> I'm coming over here to the believer's corner. No, no. Oh, my gosh. Now my six minutes is down to four. You girls are messing me up. I go over. She said, don't even try it. <laughs> you is messed up. Okay, I'm way back here, impersonal and far away. <laughs> Verse 1, chapter 3. Since you were raised with Christ. That little word, if, is a Greek word that means since. He's not questioning your salvation. He's not challenging you. He's not saying, if you're really saved, then live this way. It's important that you know that. He's saying, since you're saved, since you've been risen with Christ. Now, read it if the way you know if in the English. It's important to know this stuff. If you've been risen with Christ, since you've been risen with Christ, seek the things which are above. He's not saying if you've really been risen with Christ, then you need to live this way. He's not questioning your salvation. He's not challenging your life. You get what I'm saying? It's important you know that stuff. Because we challenge our own lives sometimes. We look introspective with a negative review. And we question things in a wrong way. Since you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are where? Above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now look, God knows the temptation of your mind. He knows the way our minds kind of wander, sometimes past practice, sometimes familiar stuff. Sometimes just the way that seems right that's taught us for years crops up, right? Set your mind. You hear that? Set your mind. He wants you to lock in on things above and understand what this means. Set your mind on things above, not things on the. Wow. See why I say not to let life speak louder than truth. And understand the perspective of heaven and see what Christ looks like in the midst of every challenge of your life. Look, for you died. See, you didn't pray a prayer to get your name in the book. I don't know where we ever got into teaching that, making the whole thrust of the gospel to get your name in the book. It's getting your nature reborn. Of course, your name's in the book, and I celebrate that, and I'm excited. Jesus said, don't rejoice that the devils are smitten. You rejoice your name's in the book of life. There's a tr what he's saying is you're back in the family. You're back into your inheritance. You ought to rejoice that you've been made right with God. So you died. Look what you did. You died. You didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who appears, who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, because this is true, every time you see a therefore, I said it last night, you know what it's there for. You have to, he's saying in light of what I've just said. Therefore, because this is true and this is your life now, put to death. He didn't say manage. He said put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication uncleanness, He's talking about sexual stuff, put to death. He didn't say manage your sex drive. He said, put to death what you've called your sex drive in the way of self-centered seeking. Fornication, just sexual desire outside of covenant, outside of true love, just meeting a need, flesh desire. He didn't say manage it. He says, put it to death. It's a self-serving desire. It's a, it's a passion. It's an evil desire. Anything self-centered is at the expense of another. True? Come on. Does love lay its life down for another? Then selfishness lives at the expense of another. Do you see how perverted that is? It's the total opposite. We were raised in selfishness. We were raised living at the expense of each other, but you were created to be loved. You were created to be loved. And got cut off from love through the fall. Got born into Adam. Insecurity. Identity crisis. And all your life you needed love. And the truth is you're created to love. Not need love. Because God is love. You're created to love. God made man in his image. And God is love. So God made man to love. And in God he was fulfilled. He was grafted in. He's the vine. We're the branch. So we've become love in our creative value. When man ate the tree that died and man became self-centered, got cut off from love and became in desperate need of love. So that's why you and I were insecure our whole lives. That's why we live to find ourselves along the way. That's why in elementary school when somebody made fun of you, it devastated you and you felt embarrassed for the first time in a crowd and worried about what people thought about you and you were on your way to identity crisis insecurity. 
So it's a rat race. It's every man for himself. You try to find yourself along the way of life. Some people have stronger dispositions and seem to be winning in that battle. Some people get crushed. The people that are winning are still in a rat race. Their hearts are all messed up. They're just living at the expense of one another, lording their progress over others full of pride. So you can win a rat race, you're still a rat. What does it profit if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? It's not about winning a rat race, it's about getting out of that race and running the race. You follow me? So we're created to love. So we're going to put to death these things by realizing we were never made for these things, we were made for His image. He's not talking about you biting your lip and doing better. You'll see. I need to teach you this because it's all in your relationship with God. It'll change our lives forever if we'll just draw into this relationship place and get close to Him. Because that thing in Mark 3 I said about, He called them to Himself, those who He wanted. And your Bible says, some translations say, and He ordained them that they might be with Him. Some Bibles say he appointed, it's Mark 3, it's verse 13, and they appointed, he appointed them that they might be with him. Some Bibles say he ordained them that they might be with him. Are you ordained? Yeah, brother. What are you ordained into that I might be with him? And it says, and from there, from the place of being with him, he sent them out to preach and heal and et cetera, et cetera, and authority over all kinds of diseases. From what place? From being with him. Oh, that's your identity, being with him. You live from that place. You follow me? Your calling's not just signs and wonders. It's to be with him. Intimacy. Father, thank you that you love me. God, my life is so on purpose. If you're struggling with addictions, you wake up in the morning. Father, I thank you that my life's in you, that you're the one that empowers today. You're the one that keeps my mind clear and my heart free. I have no other need but to know you. And I trust my life with you. And nobody's looking in the world. And you slip to your knees. I yield to you and I honor you and I put myself as clay in your hands. You're the potter of my life. Fashion me with your creativity. Let the master creativity that you possess have its place in me and make me a masterpiece in your sight, God. Thank you for your love for me. It's just prayer. You address that thing. You declare you're more than addiction. You're more than falling away. You're more than the desire of pulling at you. And if that thing tries to pull at you, you lift up your voice and you say, right in the face of the pool, Father, I thank you that you've transformed me forever. You are the satisfaction, the fulfillment of my life. You meet every one of my needs. I'm complete in you. I don't need a high. I don't need a drunk. I don't need a sexual favor. I don't need the flesh. You live inside of me and I'm a man of the spirit. See, we don't teach to pray that way. We just pray about things. We pray about trouble. We pray about people. And it's not that that's wrong, but that's really all we pray about most of the time. We don't understand communion with God. We don't understand to exchange truth and let grace have its way. You're saved by grace through faith. When you release faith in what you've become, grace makes it your reality. When you get in agreement with love and start believing you were made for love, grace makes your heart one with love. And all of a sudden you get thrown in a situation and you don't try to apply the sermon that Pastor Kevin or Gary preached. You've just become love in the secret place of your life with him. Because if you seek him in the secret, he's who in secret will see you there and reward you where? What do you seek in the secret? You're seeking he who seeks him. Who are you seeking? Him. What's your reward in the open? Him. It's not blessings, it's Him. Yeah. You get it? You guys tired? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not tired. I'm actually going to go run so I'm not too wound up tonight. Yeah. I really am. I'm going to go run five miles just so I don't mess up tonight. So I'm subdued a little. Won't it? <laughs> I got to take the edge off a little. I'm so wired. You let me preach the gospel all day. It's your fault. I'm like, ah! He's like, are you all right, man? Yeah! <laughs> How you doing? Good! You've <laughs> been talking along. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Don't present your members to these things, right? It's all idolatry. It's idolatry. It's putting something above who God is and who you are. It's idolatry. Wow. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves all walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to 
put off these things, anger. He didn't say manage it. Anger management is very popular on the earth. But what you're saying in anger management, you're saying anger is okay. I just need to control it a little. Oh, okay. So you're really angry. Jesus says, look, it's not about you just actually physically sleeping with the woman. If you lust for her in your heart, you've already. He says. You say, do not murder, but I say, if you hate your brother, you've already killed him. Because if you hate him, you've cut off his purpose, his destiny. You don't see his value. You've positioned yourself as God and you've judged his face value. So if you hate a man, you've killed a man in your own heart. So you're telling me it would be cool. What's your name, man? Jake. So I get to know Jake, and Jake rubs me wrong. And it say it's possible. It's kind of a joke. <laughs> so Jake rubs me wrong, and all of a sudden I gain this animosity to Jake. But outwardly, I'm doing the Christian thing because I'm supposed to make peace. But actually, I could care less about Jake now because he's ticked me off, and he's just such a, and I don't know why. And look at him walking, strutting his head. Yeah. And next thing you know, he comes by and I say, hey, man. And I'm surface. That's hypocrisy. I'm doing this thing, and yet... I have anger towards Jake in my heart, and I call that anger management. That's chameleon, hypocrisy. I'm teaching myself how to wear a mask, and I'm not even being real with Jake, and it's at the cost of my own heart. I'm doing him injustice. I'm playing a game, and it's crushing me inside. You get that? It'd be like walking by Sister Sally. Well, hey, honey, you look nice today. Oh, brother. It should not be okay to live that way. You ought to sharpen your conscience beyond that and not be dull and think that's okay. You follow me? You don't ever want to live that way. So it doesn't say to manage anger. It says put off anger. Wrath, malice, blasphemy. I have a serious question. It says don't lie to one another. Why? You put off the old man and his deeds. How do I not be angry anymore Without biting my lip and getting trapped into works trying not to be angry. How do I put off fornication, evil desire, passion and lust, which is all idolatry, without making a New Year's resolution and saying, okay, I'm going to do better. How do I put off anger without risking failing and just biting my lip trying not to be angry? It's a good question. Because that's usually what we do because we are sincere. And we care. You're saved by grace through faith. You're not biting your lip to be a better person today. You realize who you're created to be. You realize who you've become. And grace makes you that very person you're willing to be. So here's what you do. You get alone with God. It says put off the old man and his deeds. And guess who, who, what else you do? You put on who? The new man. Who is he? He's renewed in knowledge. You see why I teach so much? He's renewed in knowledge according to what? The image of him who made him. So you see where I get that? That we're all restored back to his original value, his creative value, his image. He made us for his image. And we're all supposed to be renewed according to the image of him who created him. So the new man looks like its father. When man fell, he got re-fathered. He fell into a lie. He took on the nature of God's enemy. He got born again and got re-fathered from above. You get it? So how do you put it off? You get along with God. How do you put it on? How do you put it off? How do you put the old on and put the new, put the old off and put the new on? You get alone with God in your intimacy, driving to work, in the shower, laying on your bed at night, purposely walking and praying, whatever. But wherever you meet with God's your secret place. Don't make an appointment with him. Commune with him. Don't like say, well, we got to pray an hour a day. Wow, 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 wow. You'll make an appointment. If you just talked to your wife an hour a day for the rest of your marriage and met her for an hour a day and went on with your life, you'd probably have a terrible distant marriage. So you'll never get to know God just praying for an hour. You commune your heart with Him. You don't, people come to me and say, how long do you pray? How much do you pray? Man, I don't even, I don't even want to answer that because you might try it. How do I know? I just talk to Him. He's just real. He's my Father. We commune. We have relationship, and he never leaves me. We're always one. Now, is there times like David where you pray specifically, where you intercede, where you believe for your city? That's a different form of prayer. 
I'm talking about communion. I'm talking about relationship. I'm talking about you putting off, putting on. Father, I thank you. You didn't make me for anger, frustration, wrath, malice, selfishness, stress, striving. You made me for love. I submit to your image. Holy Spirit, thank you for doing a work in me. Father, I relinquish every permission to just have animosity, unforgiveness, anger, a disposition that just looks like a snake, since we're on snakes. And Father, I just thank you that you've changed me and you're continuing to change me in the revelation and knowledge of your love. God, I surrender myself to you and thank you that I'm a peacemaker. God, you've made me a loving man. You're causing me to see the value of people. I have no permission in my conscience, my heart, or my knowledge to live in the flesh. I am a man of the spirit. I have a body and, and, and I have a soul and I live in a body, but my body just follows along. My soul's in agreement. My spirit rules. My flesh says, yes, sir. God, you're doing a work in me. It's just you putting off, putting on. God, I inherited the right to be angry. I inherited the right to be judgmental. I inherited the right to be full of pride. I am born again now. I will never be the same. I put off those things and no longer are they acceptable. No longer do they have human wisdom wrapped around them in a permission slip in my life. They are not who I am. And God, you're the one that fills me. You're the one that satisfies me. You're the one that looks through my eyes and causes me to see what you've always beheld. And God, you're the one that makes me one with you. I am pumped to be born again. My life will never be the same. Never again will I be brought down by these old familiar things. They will be strange to me. And you have become my reality. That's communion. That's prayer. That's fellowship. I've talked to countless Christians that don't even know they can do that. And don't even understand to do that. They just pray about trouble, their kids, their job, and their circumstances. I know tons of Christians that never, when they were alone, just said, Father, thank you for loving me and making my life valuable and precious and just showing me how much you care. You don't even talk like that to God. It's a big deal when you start believing that. Watch this. Instead of asking for prayer for deliverance, getting alone and saying, Father, I thank you. You have delivered me. Nothing owns me but the blood. Nothing owns me but your Holy Spirit. Nothing owns me but the truth. I'm not for sale. I am captivated. I'm not even my own. I'm consumed by you. God, there's no vacancy. You have filled me all in all. I am complete in Christ Jesus. <laughs> it's a good way to pray. You okay? And watch this. Therefore, as the elect of God, because all this is true, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Do you hear what you're doing? You're putting them on. You're not trying to be merciful. Okay, I need to show her mercy, but she really bugs me. Oh, man. It's okay, honey. No, no. It's it's okay. Come on, that's silly. That's outward. That's hypocrisy. Put on tender mercies. Father, I thank you that your heart and my heart are one. When I look at men, I have the same compassion that you see them in. Father, I thank you I have patience. I don't have to pray for patience. If I don't have patience, I just don't have love because love is patient. There's a joke in the church. Don't ask for patience. God will give it to you. When you don't have patience, you're confessing you don't have love. The first attribute of love is patient. So if you don't have patience, just get formed in love and cover the whole thing. Don't pray in separate attributes. <laughs> She's going to put on love. You're going to put on tender mercy. She's going to put on kindness, humility, meekness. It would be good to take a Bible like this and a section of Scripture and walk alone with God. Take a walk in the park. Sit in your bedroom. Father, I thank you. I'm holy and beloved by you. You've washed me clean. You've made me pure. Listen how amazing. You call me the elect of God. Father, you chose me. You called me out of darkness. God, you snatched me out of the fire. I was blind and you made me see. You love me. And you call me holy and beloved because the blood has washed me clean. You've changed my heart forever. And Father, I thank you. I'm putting on tender mercies. I'm a man of love. I'm called to make peace. I show mercy. I've obtained it and I've become it. I've been forgiven and I'm living, walking forgiveness. Man has no power over me. You've consumed me, God. And I thank you when I look at humanity. Nothing but compassion rules my life. It's prayer. That's the word coming out of you and you're reading it and you're putting it on as you're reading it 
And I'm bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint, call his pastor and file it. No! Even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all these things, put on love. He doesn't say do love. He says put it on. There's a difference. Put on love. Why? It's the bond of perfection. I'm way late. You won. It's just because you didn't believe. <laughs> I'm so kidding you. <laughs> hey, it was the woman you gave me. Hey, look, if you were in the gay front row, I probably would have quit on time. Don't look at me. That's what Adam did in the garden to his one flesh. The first expression of sin, blame shifting and self-justifying. Did you ever do that in your life? Adam, how did you know you were naked? Did you eat the tree? It was a yes or no question. He either ate the tree or he didn't. You know what he said? It was the woman you gave me. She gave me to eat. What's he saying? Look, don't look at me, pal. You're the one that pulled her out of me. If you wouldn't have gave me the woman, probably wouldn't have ate the tree. So you guys work it out. He said, woman, what is this you've done? The devil made me do it. It's exactly what she said. Adam said it was either you or her. And she said, hey, it was the devil. And the truth is, the devil can't make you do anything. Right? So it wasn't you. You're awesome. We're becoming love. You put it on. You put it on, guys, in your relationship. Don't fault find with yourself. Don't try to clean up first. Just start putting it on. You put it on and watch your life change. Don't just pinpoint an area and try harder. You declare who you really are created to be and who you really are and watch grace change the action. You make the tree good and you watch the fruit be good. <laughs> You got substance abuse stuff that pulls on you and creeps into your life. You got pornography temptations that you gave yourself to and it comes back and tries to rope you in. As soon as it whispers a little bit, Father, I thank you for the change in my life. I thank you my life is so much more than the past practice and behavior. I thank you there's no drive in me. There's no compulsion in me except to know you and be loved by you. Father, I worship you and I honor you and thank you for the... Once you start doing that and you start thinking like a son, you'll live like a son. And the power of that voice that once constrained you will lose its authority. You submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee. It didn't say resist the devil. You submit to God. It's a one step program. When you submit to God, you've resisted the devil. And he has nowhere to land, so he'll flee. You get it? Now look, this whole day was just teaching. I don't know what tonight looked like, but I just really felt like pouring some things out. And I know I kept you here long, and I can tell it's time to quit. But thanks for being here. I, I, don't, I didn't see a lot of ministry this afternoon, this morning. I just felt like there's such a power in truth. And I would love if we just honor truth. You know, my buddy Todd, who a lot of you know and respect so much, he honors truth as much as anybody I've ever met in my life. I've taught him that from the beginning, and he has taken it, man. He is so changed. Like, that guy behind the scenes is as pure and sold out and holy as any man I know. And it's because he values truth above everything. And that's a man you respect. I'm bringing up his name because you guys know him in this area. He's been very influential in this town. And it's because he honors truth above everything. You honor truth above everything. And if the way you're thinking doesn't build up, encourage, or edify your life, then it ain't from God. If it's not producing good things, it's not Jesus. If it's just leveling you out, not God. If it's adding to you, increasing you, shaping you, you're on the right path. Amen? Amen? So I just love you. Thanks for your patience. Can we pray something? Can I bless you? Can we pray? Now listen, you guys always have the right in settings like this to connect, love each other. If you're ever in a room like this and you need healing, you want healing, you say, oh man, he ain't even praying for the sick. 
And it, we're trained that way. And then we walk out of the church disappointed and think, man, there wasn't even no altar call. We're the body of Christ. We're family. There's love everywhere. Man, if you need healing, just grab somebody. Just lift your hand and say, hey, guys, before somebody, can somebody agree with me and pray? I'll bet you somebody will say, yeah. You say, I want you to pray. That's the problem. I want Jesus to touch you through his people. Where does Christ live? In us. He's the hope of glory. So if we believe, we lay hands on the sick. The sign doesn't follow a gifted person. It follows a believer. We're all believers. It doesn't say these signs shall follow the gifted. These signs shall follow the believer. Who's a believer? So if there's need in this room, man, sniff it out. Discern it out. Ask and it shall be given. Let's learn to be a family. Let's not just turn everything into an order call. Let's just be really real and let's just be lovers of one another. And let's have such a confidence of the Christ in us that we're willing to express it and give it away. Okay? So yay? Okay, so not like, man, no water call. You be your own water call. <laughs> you be your own lover of men, okay? Father, I bless this house and I thank you for the impartation of truth. I thank you for the word of God bringing great fruit and great victory in our lives. And I'm asking you, Father, for a grace that fixes us on the word like never before. I'm asking you, Lord, that we get so single-eyed, so single-eyed, I really don't do this kind of stuff. It's extremely rare. I can count on one hand when I've done this stuff, but I saw this, so I'm just going to do it just now. Just put your hands over your eyes, would you? And just believe right now that God is just helping to make you so single-eyed because you want to be. And Father, we touch our eyes and we bless our eyes. And we say our eyes are holy and behold the truth. And we declare, God, that our eyes are single, that our eyes see what you see, and our heart believes it. And God, we bless our eyes and we lay hands on our eyes and we say, even though our eyes are two, yet they be one. And Father, they're not divided. We're not wide view lens. We're not multiple choice. We have a single eye. Help us to see truth like no time in our life. Help truth to just make sense in the moment. Let me be simple. Let me be childlike. Let me be innocent in your sight. And God, I receive the blessing of my eyes. And God, I thank you. You've empowered me to see in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. I love you with all my heart. We'll see you, what, time? Seven or something? Or you didn't give me an extra hour at 8-6?